Dear sisters and brothers in Christ, because Jesus has made you free, you are free indeed. And may you live as children set free by God each and every day. Amen. Please join me in prayer. Lord, we thank and praise you for your son, Christ Jesus, for the blood that he shed for on our behalf, that we might be saved. Wash us and make us clean. Use us as your instruments to share your good news in this world. Lord, we thank you always that it was not something of our will, not something that we have done, but it is all your work within us, cleansing us and making us righteous, that one day we might join you in life eternal forever, in that promised land that we look forward to joining you in. Lord, help this be our hope and our stay, this day and all days. In the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. WWJD, what would Jesus do? Do you remember when they used to have those t-shirts or those bracelets that people would wear? Maybe some of you had those bracelets and you would wear those bracelets as a reminder that wherever you were, you could remember, what would Jesus do in this situation? I personally had a blue one emblazoned with white writing, what would Jesus do? Well, just the, the WWJD. And it was meant to remind me that when I was driving, what would Jesus do? How would Jesus drive? When I was watching TV, what would Jesus watch on TV? And if you had one of these bracelets, you know what I'm talking about, or one of these T-shirts. You know, I, I don't see them very often anymore. In fact, I was debating with Carla as to whether it's been 10 or 15 years since I've seen these bracelets regularly worn by Christians. Do you remember them at least? The, those, those bracelets, though, they, they seem to be put away. And I, I've wondered what, what the reason was for that. I wondered if it, maybe it's uh, that people were worried about false advertising. They put away those bracelets because they didn't want people to say, ah, that's a Christian. He or she is going to live a different life than everyone else. You know, it's like the person who has a fish on the back of their car, who after they pass over in front of you, cutting you off and nearly taking off your front bumper, they also wave at you with that single finger to let you know you're number one in their life. False advertising, I think so. Or maybe that's not what it is. Maybe... People put away their WWJD bracelets. Well, because maybe they didn't really want to know what Jesus would do. They wanted to live their lives how they wanted to live their lives. Many young Christians who bought these when they were in high school or maybe even younger, they, they had these bracelets that they wore and they, they were on fire for the Lord, but then something happened. And they put away that bracelet because, well, they didn't really care anymore what Jesus would do. They wanted to know what, well, what I would do. So it was a WWJD, what would Jonathan do? Or, or WWGD, what would Gary do? Or, or WWDD, what would Donna do? And, and, and you understand what I'm saying here. And I think that's part of it as well, unfortunately. For me personally, I actually lost my bracelet. But I thought about that question a little bit. What would Jesus do? And whether you owned a t-shirt or a bracelet with those four letters on it, have you asked yourself that question before? What would Jesus do if he was in my shoes? What would Jesus do if he was walking the steps I walked? If you've ever considered this question, you've probably also thought to yourself, that is an impossible standard. Because if we look at Jesus as our example, which we should, don't get me wrong here, we know he lived a perfect life. He did not give in to sins, not even the sins of thought, the sins of desire. He lived a perfect life. And that's a good thing for us because it is his blood, his perfect blood that redeemed us. And so maybe instead of asking, what would Jesus do? Maybe our question should be WDJD. And I know WDJD doesn't roll off your tongue as well, but what does Jesus desire? WDJD, what does Jesus desire? What does Jesus desire of your life? What does Jesus desire you to use your talents for, your gifts, your abilities for? Why are you here in El Centro in 2015? Why weren't you born 100 years ago, 200 years ago? Why weren't you born in the last century? Why are you here at this time in history? What is Jesus using you for? WDJD. Unfortunately, many of us as Christians, we, we don't ask that question, do we? In fact, usually if you think about your prayer life, how does your prayer life usually go? Do you usually ask of God, what do you desire of my life, Lord? 
Or is it usually the other way around? What can you do for me, God? How can you take care of my life? How can you take care of what I want, what I need? Think about your prayer life for a minute. And as you do, I do want to clarify that it's okay to ask God, to come to God, because He is a searcher of the hearts, and He knows the needs of your heart, and He desires that relationship. But our relationship with God should not only be, what can you do for me? But Lord, what do you desire of me to do for you? What is your desire for my life? What, how will you use me to share your gospel, to proclaim your name? I think oftentimes as Christians, it's not that we don't know the answer to that question. I think rather it's that we struggle with the answer to that question. What does God desire of you? Well, in Micah chapter 6, that's the first one that came to my mind, he asked that very question, and this is how he answers it. What does the Lord require of you but to do justice, to love kindness, and to walk humbly with your God? To do justice, to love kindness, to walk humbly with God. Easy peasy, right? You guys have no problem at all doing that, right? Loving kindness, doing justice, walking humbly with God. Pride never gets in the way, right? Right? Well, maybe Jesus gives us a little bit of clearer answer on that. What is God's desire for our lives? So he answers in the Gospel of Mark chapter 12. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. The second is this. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater. So Jesus commands us. Oh, I don't think that it's that we don't know what God's desire is for our lives. I think that it's so hard for us to hear those answers, though. Can you imagine loving your neighbor as yourself? I'm not talking about your friend who you get along with really well. I'm talking about with your neighbor who maybe you don't get along with so well, the one that, that you would just as well, when you see their number come up on caller ID, let it go to answering machine. The neighbor who you escape through the back of vans just so you can avoid talking to them. Love your neighbor as yourself. Or what about love God with everything? With all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind and with all your strength. Do you find that your, da your life is a daily, uh, a daily love of God? A daily time of showing Him that great love that you have for Him? Well, I think many of us, we know the answer to that question. The desires of God are maybe greater than we care to care to bear. And so maybe as Christians, we, we try to take the easy way out, uh, the way out that seems okay. And that's the, well, Jesus forgives me anyway. So we make our bracelets J-F-M-E-M-A. J-F-M-A. Jesus forgives me anyway. And we live lives where we live how we want to live. And we say, well, don't worry, God will forgive me. We look down at our bracelet and we're comfortable because we know that he had the, 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 the nails driven through his hands for us anyway. And that is true, but that's licentious living. And then, and then we go to Martin Luther, the late great saint Martin Luther, who, well, so often when I hear people quote this, and they only quote part of it. God does not save those who are only imaginary sinners. Be a sinner and let your sins be strong. Sin boldly. I've heard lots of Lutherans, lots of Christians say that quote. The problem is, is they don't read the rest of Luther's words there. They stop right at that sin boldly and they pat themselves on the back and say, well, even Martin Luther, the reformer, told Philip Melanchthon, sin boldly in your life. Live it however you want to. I'm going to read the whole quote and I'm going to start over again with that phrase that he that we so often quote. It's a short quote, so just bear with me, but listen closely. God's, God does not save those who are only imaginary sinners. Be a sinner and let your sins be strong. Sin boldly. But let your trust in, God, in Christ be stronger. And rejoice in Christ, who is the victor over sin, death, and the world. Let your trust in Christ be stronger. Martin Luther's not inviting you to sin however you'd like to sin. If you're going to sin, just go hog wild on it and do whatever you'd like to do. What he is saying is that know that even in your sins, be faithful and confess those sins to God and He will 
because of Christ, forgive you of those sins. The love of Christ is greater. He is inviting us to trust that no matter what sin is on our heart, no matter what sin we've committed, even if it's one we won't talk about with anyone else, we can bring that to God and our trust in Him should be greater for He forgives all sin because He is victor over sin, death, and the world. Paul says the same thing. He says that we should recognize the grace of God, but that we should not keep sinning that grace may abound. He says it so clear in Romans 6. What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? By no means. Triple exclamation point. We don't keep sinning just so we can see God's hand of forgiveness at work because we have been called and set free from sin. We have been set free by the blood of the Lamb, by Christ Jesus Himself. We have been set free to be the people of God, to live as His people in this world. And that's sometimes difficult for us as Christians in this day and age, isn't it? Because we live in a world where instead of it just being God's law to be our our guide, we live in a world that it's easier to just blend in, to fit into the background, to be wallflowers standing back. It's easier for us to just stand back and say, well, what can I do? Where can God use me? Lord, how can you desire anything of me? We put on bracelets that say that that are B-I-W-T-W. Blend in with the world. And we blend in. And we're content to do that. Oh, we might have the greatest message of of all, the gospel message, but we're content to bear that bracelet, blend in with the world, and silently shrug off to the corner. God has commanded us to be salt and to be light. To be those who bring the gospel message of hope. To bring love to this world. Many Christians, I've heard them ask the question in the last week, is what do we do now that the Supreme Court has made this decision? Well, they're all in a tizzy over Europe and over the U.S. of A. And they're worried about what we are to do under these laws. And I say, why? Why are we worried? God's command hasn't changed for us. God's command is to love the world, to share the gospel message in this world. God didn't tell us that because the world changes around us that his message changes. Isn't that the beautiful truth? That his message has never changed. That the message is still the same today as it was yesterday, and it will be forever. That we are blood-bought sinners. That there are sinners inside this church, and there are sinners outside this church. And Jesus came to, to redeem those who are in the church and those who are outside the church. That those who have committed sins that we might not agree with, that God still forgives those sins. I bet if you talk to the people next to you, you have committed a sin they may not have, or maybe they have. And they might be embarrassed to confess it to you that God forgives that sin as well. And God forgives every sin. And so what do we do in this world, changing world that that we live in? We continue to do what God has commanded. We share His love. We share His mercy. And we share His forgiveness. Because we are blood-bought sinners. We are those who have been cleansed and redeemed. Jesus set us free by His blood to share His love, to share His compassion, Jesus set us free by His blood to do justice, to be a voice for those who do not have a voice, to stand up for those who we may or may not agree with, but but need someone to stand up for them. Jesus freed us by His blood so that we might love mercy, so that we might not look at those who are different than us, those who maybe don't have the same social, economic benefits we have, and instead of judging them, show mercy to them, show love to them. Jesus has freed us by his blood so that we might live humbly with him, live as those people in the world who are servants to the world as Jesus himself came to serve the world. When Jesus came into the world, he didn't try to color in the lines of the Pharisees. He didn't try to fit into the world. In our gospel lesson for this morning, Mark chapter 3, the Pharisees, they said, oh no, You can't heal somebody on the Sabbath. You can't do that kind of work on the Sabbath. Oh, that is terrible. And look at the heart of Jesus. Jesus' heart was burdened. He was angry because they had no kindness, no compassion. They weren't willing to show that grace, that grace that God had shown them, that grace that God shows us. And truly, that is the greatest gift we have, God's grace. For we have been set free by the blood of Christ 
that we might love our Heavenly Father with all our heart, with all our soul, with all our mind, with all our strength, that we might love our God with everything we have and then love the world too as He has first loved us. When we ask of the Lord, WD, JD, what does Jesus desire? Lord, what do you desire of me? This isn't an obligation, something we do because we have to do it. This is something we're invited to do. An opportunity we have to live as God's light in this world darkened by sin. To live as God's people proclaiming the hope that we have. That because Jesus' blood has set us free, we will join our Lord in eternity forever. Amen. Please pray with me. Oh Lord, in this world that we live in, we know that it's constantly changing around us. We know that at times that we struggle to, to be a light, to be those who share your gospel truth. Forgive us for those times when we're content to just blend in. Forgive us for those times when we've just become apathetic and we stop caring and we only worry about ourselves. Forgive us for those times. And we just simply say, well, you'll forgive us anyway. We thank you that you do forgive us. Whether or not we deserve it, because we know that we don't. We thank you that you do forgive us because of Christ's blood, the blood he shed on the cross for each and every one of us. We thank you that you have given us this forgiveness and the hope and promise that we shall rest secure with you in our promised land that is heaven. Lord, help us each day to live as your people with hope and with a desire to share your message. Lord, let us not ask how we might just blend in with the world, but let us instead ask with boldness and with joy what you desire of our hearts so that we too might share the gospel message proclaiming your good news. Lord, we thank you for this hope and this promise. And so it is in the powerful name of our Savior Jesus we pray. Amen.